from popular political commentators like Marcus Rogers and Brandon Tatum, or even Christian recording artists like Phillips, Craig, and Dean, and even one of the more popular pastors in America, known as T.D. Jakes, and other apostolic churches all over the world, the doctrine of modalism, oneness, or Jesus-onlyism has actually been gaining in popularity. So to discuss this very important topic is none other than the president and founder of Good Fight Ministries and pastor of Blessed Hope Chapel in Simi Valley, California, Pastor Joe Schimmel. Praise God, Chad. This is an important topic because we're dealing with the Godhead. We're dealing with who is God and how has he revealed himself in Scripture. And we've looked at Scriptures this through this series that the Bible warns about believing in a different Jesus, different gospel, receiving a different spirit. Uh, it's very important to God. It's important to him that we understand who he is. And we don't want to mess with the revelation as he's given his self-revelation of himself through Scripture and also modify it to something that's less than who he is. Yeah, and one of the things that hopefully this will help you is that we've worked on, as Joe mentioned, on this series that we're working on, on the deity questions regarding Jesus and regarding the Holy Spirit. And we will put a link in the description, and hopefully this will be a part of a wonderful playlist for you to maybe come to a better understanding via Scripture what the Bible actually teaches regarding Jesus. Is he truly God, the Holy Spirit? Is he truly God, or is he simply an it, as some people and want to teach? in contrast to what the cults teach, because they're, coming, they're knocking at your door. They're wanting to convert you to their Johnny-come-lately revelations. No, that's exactly right. And this is one of those, while there are early attestations of this false doctrine, we also see that this is one that, you know, was dying off mostly and kind of had a resurgence at the same time as most of the cults that we yeah, see it's today. Known as modalism, it has different, goes by different names, but uh, it was refuted as a heresy in the early church. And you can look at Polycarp and you can look at, you know, Ignatius and the earliest of the apostolic writers and see that they definitely made a distinction between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And modalism is that idea. And we're, you know, we're breaking that down so you understand what we're dealing with. We're talking about oneness Pentecostals. They're pretty much the, the greatest threat. And we'll talk about what that is as we move on. No, and when you look at it, oneness Pentecostal, modalist, and, and so forth, I know that for us, we've planted a church down in Mexico, in Ensenada, Mexico, Blessed Open Ensenada, pastored by Pastor Jonathan Ball down there. And when we originally started going down there five, six years ago, uh, on a regular basis before God put it on the heart of the church to to really start there, uh, put it on Jonathan's heart, really, and then move through the church to uh, plant a church, build a house, build a church down there, and just it's flourishing, and it's amazing. Uh, but before that happened, you know, I know that when we were pre preparing to go do mission work down there, it's like, okay, we got to get our notes down for Catholicism because down in Mexico, a lot of people, especially with Spain, the, the Spanish influence and, and so forth, a lot of Catholicism has come into the ranks there in Mexico, and that is the religion that is keeping people from the true gospel of Jesus Christ in but Mexico. we were surprised to find something out. We were was... very surprised, and that was the fact that so many of the people we went to go share the gospel with weren't Catholic, but they were what they call apostolic. Mm -hmm. And apostolic churches down there, they teach a number of different doctrines. They're basically oneness, oneness Pentecostals. But they are oneness denying Pentecostals. Denying the Trinity, denying the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as three persons in the one Godhead, saying there's just one person. And the idea of modalism, Chad, comes from, you know, we get that word mode, uh, modes, that, that God is just one person. There's no true Son and true Holy Spirit, but there's just one person who reveals himself through three modes, you know? Like a mother is also a daughter and is also someone's sister, but she's one person. Uh, and they try to use illustrations like that. And a lot of Christians who believe in the triunity of God, believe in the triune Godhead, that the Trinity, three persons, they will describe the Trinity that way sometimes. It's not a good, good illustration of the Trinity because it really falls into the snare of modalism. And it really kind of really fits modalism, that whole concept about, you know, mother, sister, daughter is one person because we don't believe that God just adopts modes. We believe that God exists from all eternity past and has revealed himself as existing from eternity past as Father and Son and Holy Spirit, three distinct persons, three distinct eternal persons that coexist together. And that's how God has revealed himself through the pages of Holy Scripture. So modalism is a heresy that denies the triunity of God. Amen. And one of the things that I was so blessed with on our second trip when we went down there 
was we were studying, uh, there's a book uh, out, and it's called Does God Love Everyone? And one of the first things that, uh, I think it's uh, Wells uh, who, who wrote that, and one of the first things he brings out is the fact that before God created the world, love already existed in that the Father loved the Son, the Son loved the Father, Amen. the Father loved the Holy Spirit, and so forth. So you have the, this being that is God existing and loving each other already, long before even the creative order and creation came into play. And so that was something that was really on my heart to share with people down there in Mexico, and then to see the legalism that takes place in these churches as well. But that coincides with not understanding the nature of God. I just have to be honest yeah, with you. Yeah, and, and that kind of falls in, I think you're talking about, yeah, Jerry Walls, right? Jerry Walls, thank is, you. I think you're, uh, that heresy that falls into the same, you know, idea of Islam that teaches that Allah, you know, God is just one person for eternity past. And the crazy thing is, if, if that's the case, uh, which it's not, is that who does God love before he creates anyone? How can he be loved? The Bible says, tells us that God is love, that God gave his only begotten son. The only way God can be loved before he creates is if so he has someone to, to love, and that's his nature. And we have love between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So uh, it's interesting because that's an argument we use to Muslims, saying, hey, Amen. your God is deficient. He can't even be loved because he's... He has no one to love for eons. Yeah, know? and that's one of the things that we'll get into is that difference of a Unitarian version of God versus a monotheistic version of God, which is the triune Godhead. Because what we have to do is, it's one thing to use these terminologies. Oh, tri Trinity is not used. Some people say it's Theophilus earlier, and others people say Tertullian is the first one. Trinatas is the first one to popularize the term. Either way. What happens in the early church, the same thing that we have to do, is we have to examine the written word of God and say, what does God's word say? And then bow down to what God's word has already said on the subject. So when people will go, oh, well, this word's not in the Bible, this word, neither is oneness, and, and so forth. But what we have to do is say, we are going to bow down to whatever the word of God says. And Amen. this is how, when we're reading certain scriptures, which we have to get into, we're never going to get there, Joe. But Amen. <laughs> yeah, but if we're if we're going to bow down and say we have to make sense of these things and we have to rightly divide the word of truth, we have to do that by what Scripture says. And so I, I have to list these guys. I have to list some names and, and a little bit yeah. of the argumentation to go so, into so that, know, know so that you guys can understand. Um, one of the things that happens if you're witnessing to a Jehovah's Witness, Joe, is this is the straw man that they will bring to you when you are typically, and I'm telling you this from experience, when you are typically sharing with a Jehovah's Witness about the triune Godhead and the way that God has described himself in his word, what they will paint you as is a modalist, and that's what their thought process is. They'll ask questions to you like, well, then who was Jesus praying to? Which is the same question I would ask yeah. a modalist, right. right? They'll ask questions like that, and then you'll have to dig them out of that and explain it before you can actually get into these important Which topics. Which shows you how disingenuous the Watchtower movement is, Amen. because it's not the— the rank and file, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses are coming up with that argument. They're being fed that argument from the Watchtower. And hey, tell them, well, who's Jesus praying to? If, if you know, if there's a, you know, and Jesus so is the Father. If yeah. he is the Father, and it's like they know the Watchtower that Christians don't believe that. They know that, but they tell them to say that. And by the way, a lot of Christians get confused, like because uh, some Christians, that is a lot in the rank and file. They don't understand the the nature of God and how. He's three persons and uh, shares the same essence, but just as husband and wife, the two shall become one flesh. And I want to get into the whole cod and, you know, the two and the one and all that because we don't have time for that. But it's a great picture in the scripture. Uh, my wife and I were one, but we share the same, and we share the same essence as humans, but we're two distinct persons. It's not the same with the, the Godhead because God is one, like my wife and I are not one because they share the essence. And the illustration I've used for years because it's so powerful is if you if you put three candles together, you have one flame, but you have three candles. They share the same essence, so you really have one flame. There's one God, but there's three persons within the Godhead. Yeah, and and any analogy that we use, even ones down. even ones that are not uh, her heretical on accident on some of these, because some of them are. Some of them are heretical because they're taught by heretical teachers. So when guys like T.D. Jakes have taught. You know, God is like with water, you know, a one is teacher and, you know, God's like with water. You have water, you have ice and you have steam. And it's like, uh, no, no, that's modalism. Uh, and then you have him kind of vacillating, sitting in the elephant room there with Mark Driscoll. 
man, just a, a bunch there. But anyways, Joe, if we don't get into this, we're not going to get into this. So it is important for us to establish in the scriptures what the Bible actually says concerning this topic, because we need to know, and that's the question we'll ask at the end, is this a place where we break off fellowship with mm-hmm. someone? Is this a place where we could say, is this a damnable or flammable heresy? And I'm not going to ask Joe that until we get to the very last question, because we're going to be looking at the scriptures, because ultimately, the word of Chad, the word of Joe, does not matter. The word of God does. So Joe, let with all of that, is God just simply one, as in Jesus going into these different modes, Jesus only, right? We, we, we baptize people in the name of Jesus. So it's Jesus only. There is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are just simply modes that God ultimately goes into. Yeah, and Chad and I both have encountered one as people. So uh, I'm, I told Chad, hey, I kind of built an outline, kind of a survey of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation on this. And I thought, man, how much time? We don't have much time. And I know Chad and I both have a lot to say on this. So I told Chad, Let's just volley back and forth. I'll go through, I'll try to get through my entire outline, but I want Chad to share as well because Chad's actually written a track on this, which we'll talk about later as well, uh, that you, if you're dealing with oneness, uh, Pentecostals and so forth. But just in the beginning, let us make man in our image, Chad. And this is important to understand why this is so important. Many of the scriptures we're going to be using, most of the scriptures we're using, have to do with before God became a man in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and after his ascension and he was seated at the right hand of the Father. Why? Because one is Pentecostals, when you show Jesus on earth, they'll say, well, that's just the Father. He is the Father. He is Jesus. He's the Spirit. And that's just a manifestation of his one person, even though they're talking to each other as two distinct persons. But that's just a manifestation. But if you can show, Chad, and I think this is some a place that you need to go when you've got a you know oneness uh, knocking at your door. They don't do as much door knocking as Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. Some of them do, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, these are some of the things you can think of sharing with them. Let us make man in our image. You can go back to when we were going through typology. We went into the grammar of this, this passage. Is there, There's more than one person talking. And we know that God did not, it's not talking to the angels. The angels didn't create anything. God says he created everything by himself. But God is Yahweh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And we've shown over and over again that the Father and the Son and the Spirit all create. But why doesn't God say, I'm going to create everything in my image? But he says, let us make man in our image. And then that goes so well, Chad, with John 1.1. 1, 1, and we do his word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. So we're going before creation. The Word was, was God, he's, but He's with God. He is God. He was getting with God, and He became man. He created everything, then He became man. And how does He relate to the Father as a separate, or as, as the one person? Does He say, well, I will consult my inner heart, you know? No, He talks to the Father. He prays to the Father. In fact, some of the scriptures, Chad, you probably went through the same thing I did. It wasn't like, what scriptures do you use? Like, what scriptures do I need to kind of edit out or not use? And there's so many times where Jesus makes a clear distinction where he's communicating with the Father. He's talking to the Father in heaven. He talks about him as a separate, distinct person over and over again, as does the Father regarding the Son. But the Word becomes flesh. And John 1.18, Chad says, no one has seen God at any time. Jesus is God, yeah, but who haven't they seen? They haven't seen the Father at any time. The only begotten Son, or the only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So now, if no one has seen the Father any time, but they see Jesus, but if they're seeing Jesus, then he is the Father. Of course, they've seen the Father. So it'd be ridiculous. And John 3, 16 goes on. Jesus goes on to say, For God so loved the world that gave his only begotten Son. And that's throughout Scripture. But Chad, what about his baptism? Because as I go through this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with some questions because I don't want to be the only one talking here. And I know we go back and forth, and but I want you to get on this. What? Tell me, think about the ma- baptism in Matthew chapter 3. What do you see there? You know, what's interesting, Joe, is in the track that, that I wrote that we'll, hopefully we have in, we'll have in Spanish and English soon enough, but I use a different text to show that we actually have times in Scripture where we get to see all three of them yeah. in Scripture at different places. And this one specifically uh, that you're mentioning there at Jesus' baptism, you have the Father speaking, you have the Holy Spirit coming upon who? Jesus as like a dove. So you have Jesus there, the Holy Spirit, and the Father, and the, they'd have to be all in all three modes at once. Yeah. I mean, it's just, inc- you have the three separate persons of the one Godhead right there at his baptism. It's incredible. Yeah, and of course, Jesus on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That makes no sense at all if there's not Father and Son, and of course, Spirit. And of course, Jesus saying, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. We have three uh, three persons there, right? But they're all referred to as God. Some say, well, they only have one name. So, so we use the name Jesus. But Jesus distinctly said, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But some of the oneness will say, well, how come they baptize? It says that they baptize in the name of Jesus. I say, that's 
baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, no matter, because this is what they don't understand. They, they think name means literally just the name. They don't understand that name means the authority of. In fact, in Acts, uh, we read, by what power or what name did you do this? Like some will say, stop in the name of the, the law. We talk about something done in the name of the king. It speaks of the authority of. So the name there is speaking of the authority of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But Chad, it's funny because we're probably going to use a lot of the same scriptures, so we'll keep following back and forth because that's one of my favorite ways to disprove uh, oneness is also to show these persons, as, I'm, as I've been the, you know, uh, kind of the, the, the preliminary remarks we're making, I was saying that's why I don't like to just focus when Jesus is on earth. I like to focus before he becomes a man and after he's already ascended. But listen to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. We read, I kept looking, Daniel speaking, in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days. Well, who's the Ancient of Days? It's not the Son of Man, Jesus, the Father. He came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Now, we know Jesus is the Son of Man. In Mark chapter 14, verse 62, uh, he's asked, you know, if, if he's the Christ. He says, I am. And he says, you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the, now this is great, sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Now, Chad, you know in J John chapter 17, verses 4 and 5, Jesus praying, Father, glorify me. With the glory we had before but, the world was. And what's he saying there? The glorify me, the glory that we had before the world was. The same glory that in Isaiah we're told he shares with no, no one. one. That's right. With no one. Right. But he had, he shared this glory with the Father because he's God. So God, <laughs> yeah. God is God has all the glory. Amen. But they share it together and he wants to be glorified with the Father like he was in the beginning. And Jesus goes and he ascends. And uh in John 20, 17, Jesus says to Mary Magdalene, don't cling to me. He said, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Not morphed into the Father or no. ascended? ascended? Okay, to. okay, just check. Yeah, you're right, because it gets even stronger. But go and tell my brothers, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And in Mark 16, well, where did he go? After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. Now, we know, Chad, in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, there's a literal physical ascension of Jesus and they see him with their own eyes and the Mount of Olives ascend into the clouds and a couple angels standing by, you know, basically tell them, you know, you know, basically you're going to see, they say you're going to see the same Jesus that went up in the clouds that you saw with their eyes. You're going to also see him descend in the same way, which by the way, destroys, destroys preterism of the idea that Jesus came back or the Jehovah's Witness teaching that he came back in 1914 and he's just invisible and there's no real second coming that's a physical second coming. That's unscriptural as well. So Jesus is now the name above every name. But Chad, I want to read some of these scriptures about how he sits at the right hand of the Father right now as a distinct person. We read in Acts chapter 2, verse 33, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. In Acts chapter 7, verses 55 and 56. Remember Stephen? What yep, happened there? That's one of my favorite texts. And well, you share it. You have, you have Stephen there at his stoning. And one of the most beautiful things that I see, just as when I brought that text, I remember we were talking at just a, a regular discussion, you know, scriptural discussion about this topic weeks ago. And I said, yeah, one of the one of those texts that I love to go to is in Acts chapter 7, because in Acts chapter 7, you have all three persons of the Godhead represented. Yes, so powerful. clear. And then here it is in Acts 7, 54 through 56. So you don't got to take our words for it. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently he into heaven. Stephen, right? Stephen, filled with the Holy Spirit, gazes intently into heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And that is Job, so beautiful. I mean, you have all three persons of the triune He's Godhead. He's filled with the Spirit. Filled with the He's Spirit. He's gazing to heaven. God gives him a vision of the fact that Jesus, who's seated at the right hand of the Father normally, He's actually standing. Up yeah, amen. Because Jesus amen. says, If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father and the angels. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the Father. Well, yeah. Stephen is being bludgeoned and stoned to death, and he's honoring Jesus, and Jesus stands up to honor him. That's just beautiful. beautiful. And he's at the right hand of the Father. 
So you, it's not like the father and the son are just one person. You see two distinct persons there. And you see the third person, as you put out, Chad, who filled. Stephen is filled with. The very person that Jesus promised through John 14 through 16 that would come, that he would have to go yeah. so that the Holy Spirit would come. And testify of him. And testify of him. And it's like, you think that he morphed, which is, by the way, a quotation from Stephen Furtick in a sermon regarding that ascent that you talked about when Jesus yeah. ascended. And now Jesus is taken from their sight and hidden in a cloud, but he did not leave. He just changed forms. Colossians 3.1. Therefore, if you have, this is after, of course, the resurrection of Christ. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Revelation chapter 21, verse 22. I saw no temple in it, meaning in the new heaven, the new earth. For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. Why mention two different persons? But Chad, I love this too. Revelation 3.21 talks about the promises to the overcomers. Mm -hmm. And here we read with the Church of Philadelphia, he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. So Jesus will, is going to reign from his own throne. So I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Now, it's, it's, it's just amazing to me because right now you have Jesus, you overcome, you're going to sit with me on my throne, even as I overcame and sat with my father on his throne. Now, just as they are distinct persons from Jesus, Jesus is letting them know there's, he's distinct from, from the father. And I love this, Revelation 5, 5 and 6. Chad, you know that John is just weeping because, you know, the, the seven scrolled yeah. seal has to be unsealed for everything who's to worthy. be. Yeah, <laughs> and who's worthy? No one's worthy on earth, under the earth, uh, in heaven, except one. And that is Jesus. And he stands up. This is cool. He stands up again. So if you a little trivial question, you ask somebody, how many times does Jesus stand up in heaven since his resurrection? I just realized, wow, there's two times right there. First time we see that with uh, in the book of Acts with Stephen. But here in Revelation 5, 6, and 7, he says, and I saw between the throne, and he was told by the elders, stop weeping, John. The land of the tribe of Judah has overcome, so as to open the, the, the seven-scrolled seal. And I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and one of the elders of the Lamb standing as if slain, and that's Jesus, having seven horns and seven eyes, which were the seven spirits of God, sent out in all the earth. There's the Spirit, by the way, the fullness of the Spirit. Then you have the Father. And he came, that is the Lamb. He came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now, come on, man. You have Jesus standing up with, in, you know, in the, the spirit with him who sent out to the earth, this, the symbol of the, the, the horns, taking the scroll. He stands up and takes the scroll out of the hand of the father. Then he begins to pop the scrolls, uh, the, the seals from the scroll. And Chad, these are really cool too. I love these. Revelation 21, just take a, take a oneness Pentecostal here. Verses 22 and 23, he says, I saw no temple in it for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. Then he says this, and the city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. So you have two lights there, the Father and the Son. And Chad, I, and, I mean, over and over again, we see in the heavenly state, in the final state, in the eternal state, the Father and the Son are together. And it's just not an expression that Jesus at his right hand. Jesus is actually actively ministering as the Lamb of God at the right hand of the Father. And I love that, Joe. Before I get to your, your last question, I want to give a little prequel because what you're expressing so clearly there is so many times in the book of Revelation, you have the Father and the Son so yeah. unbelievably clearly there. Absolutely. But there's a prequel to that too. And you already mentioned some of it, you know, uh, Genesis 126 and so forth. But also in Genesis 19.24, it's one of my favorite places. It's a very interesting text. It is about... I love that. It, it's about raining, God raining down fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm pl plenty of you guys know the story. But if you look at Genesis 19.24, something is really interesting when you read it. Because, pay attention, in your Bible, you may see all capital, L-O-R-D, all caps. What Yahweh. that means is the divine name of God, known as the Tetragrammaton, or Yahweh. And so here's what it says. Then the Lord, okay, the Yahweh. Yahweh, rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from heaven. the the Lord, Lord the Yahweh out of heaven. The, the Tetragrammaton, Yahweh in heaven. <laughs> Two Yahwehs, one on earth, one in heaven. One Exactly, that's exactly... Right, and then also, and this is one that we dealt with in our episode, is Jesus God according to the Bible, and it's back to Isaiah 44, 6. Thus says the Yahweh, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last, and there is no God beside me. So, Joe, 
We've seen it in the Old Testament, which surprises some people to, yeah. to see this so clearly, just like it surprises some people to see so clearly the Holy Spirit as God in the Old Testament. But, but Joe, we see it in the New Testament, and now the question that we have to ask to finish this off, which is probably the most important question. One, why does it matter? It, you know, oh, they're just a, it's just little things. I watched an entire video by political ta- commentator Marcus Rogers, and he spends the whole time saying everyone's spirit filled, and uh, you know this way, you know whether you're this or whether you're that, and so forth. And let's not divide over this. We need unity. I want unity. God's told me I need unity. And then you see what he believes, and why does this actually matter? And does it come to a place where it goes from, hey, this is actually. Uh, something that's flammable that could be really dangerous, or is it actually something that is a damnable heresy? Yeah, I would I would say without you know even I mean it's obviously a damnable heresy because you're dealing with a you're denying a cardinal doctrine of Scripture. Uh, you're denying uh, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the the, the the triune Godhead. In fact, God's Word warns about this very very strongly. In fact, in First John chapter two. John says, who is the Antichrist but the one who denies the Father and the Son? And, and by the way, this is before Jesus, this is after Jesus ascended the Father. John's the one seeing him on the right hand of the Father taking the scroll, right? John's the one seeing that there's two different lights in heaven, uh, now, and then there's the Holy Spirit as well. And John says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22 and 23, who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ, this is the Antichrist, the one who denies, now they won't deny he's the Christ, but they will deny the Father and the Son. They'll say, no, no, there, there's just the Son. There's really no Father. Jesus kind of is the Father, I and mean, he's the same person. But the Bible says, this is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever He goes on to say in verse 23, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. And I'll give you a few real quick ones from 1 John that just bolster that point. 1 John 4, 14. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. 2 John 1, 3. Grace, mercy, and peace to be with you all from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. And the last one, 2 John 1, 9. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. And by the way, I had a one is Pentecostal that I ran into, really brief story. Uh, my first one I ever witnessed to and I gave this scripture to him in First John when I was a young pastor. And of course, he didn't know what to do with it. I go, I go, man, you're denying the distinction between the Father and the Son as though they don't exist and it's just the Father or it's just the Son. And he had to acknowledge that he was in conflict with that passage. No, it's so important, guys. And hopefully this will be an encouragement to you. And if you've got to share it with somebody, just click that share button. It takes two seconds to click share and send it to somebody who may be very confused on the subject. God bless you guys. We love you guys. Hey, Joe Schimmel here. We want to thank you for watching. We want to also encourage you not to forget to sign up or subscribe to Good Fight Ministries' YouTube channel. We have the most amazing content. We also have the very popular Good Fight radio show where we examine all kinds of things in light of Scripture, as well as 511 News, which is also very eye-opening. And we also have mind-blowing video exposés that you won't see anywhere else. And our 24-7 online radio station, the Good Fight Radio Network, as well as my sermons from Blessed Hope Chapel over on the Blessed Hope Chapel YouTube channel. So thanks again. We'll see you later. And we just pray that the Lord blesses you richly as you seek his face. God bless.